You know, one of the best things about shooting film is that we get to use all these wonderful vintage lenses. All metal, so full of character and history. And of course they were designed for film, so this is the only way to truly appreciate them. Oh, totally. Mind if I load the film? Yeah, sure, go ahead. <laughs> I see you got a cheeky little Sony lens on your Minolta. But you're not fooling me, I bet it was originally a Minolta lens. Ah, Minolta. They were the real mavericks of the film era, always forward-thinking. And their lenses with that Minolta color... Mm. Minolta did not make such a lens. Is that an original Sony design? Yeah, and it's actually quite good. This is over. Do not call me again. Hey folks, I'm Leo Nikishin and this is 10 Rolls of Film. And this is Minolta Autofocus, or A-mount. And I kid you not, it's one of the most important lens mounts in the entire history of photography, because when it was introduced in 1985, it became the first commercially available, mass-produced lens mount that was designed from the ground up to work with autofocus. And the camera this mount was introduced on, the Minolta 7000, is widely regarded as the first real autofocus SLR. Both the lens system and the camera were an instant hit. Within a year, Nikon introduced an autofocus version of their F-mount. Within two years, Canon introduced their brand new autofocus lens mount, the EF-mount. And the rest, as they say, is history. The 90s, 2000s, and even early 2010s were truly the golden age of autofocus SLRs, both film and digital. I could dedicate a whole episode to Minolta and their history, but Suffice to say that this was not the first, nor the last time, that they introduced a world's first. To me, Minolta always seemed to be a bit of a sob of the camera industry. A company that was not afraid to think outside the box, and often innovated ahead of its competitors. But did not always manage to really capitalize on those innovations, or keep up with further development by their competition. So, if Minolta was all that in a bag of chips, What's with this mount also been referred to as Sony A-mount? Well, that's because despite their knack for innovation, and making these in the mid-90s, Minolta initially dismissed the consumer appeal of a digital SLR. And it was only in 2004 that they finally decided to try and catch up, making Minolta, well, Konica Minolta at that point actually, the last major camera manufacturer to do so. The cameras, 7D and 5D, were decent products, but understandably, there were some teething issues that the competitors already had the time to iron out. The cameras were rather pricey, and ultimately, it was all too little too late. So in 2005, Konica Minolta first enters a partnership with Sony for future developments, and then a year later, Sony takes over the camera business completely, and buys out all relevant assets. So from 2006 onwards, all new cameras and native lenses are branded Sony, and the mount itself becomes Sony A-mount. However, Sony realized that if they want to sell Sony-branded cameras, they also need to get Sony-branded lenses on the shelves as soon as possible. And by far the easiest way to do that was to take existing Minolta designs and simply rebrand them. Which is exactly what Sony did. Much like this 20mm f2.8 here. And it worked. Very quickly, there was a fairly extensive lineup of Sony lenses. All well and good. The only problem was that many of those formerly Minolta lenses were rather pricey, especially the primes. And Sony was no doubt aware that the competitors at Canon and Nikon are selling tons of moderately fast, affordable, and yet optically decent prime lenses. Most notable example being, of course, the Nifty 50, the plastic fantastic Canon 50mm f1.8. So the smart pants at Sony decided that they also wanted a piece of the action, and in 2009-2010 they introduced the easy choice range of moderately fast, affordable, and yet optically decent prime lenses. The 30mm f2.8 macro, the 35mm f1.8, 50mm f1.8, 
And finally, the 85mm f2.8. And these are the lenses that I'm going to talk about in this series. Now, before we look at each lens individually, there are some things that apply to the easy choice range as a whole. First up, if your number one priority when choosing a lens is build quality and handling, you are dismissed. These lenses are all plastic. No, seriously, the only non-plastic parts are optical elements. Even the mount is plastic. Now, this is not to say that these lenses are built poorly. I've had multiple copies of most of them at this point and did not have a single lens break on me or get cracked or anything like that. But they certainly do not project the same sense of quality and sturdiness that metal clad lenses do. They also scratch rather easily. Secondly, the more eagle-eyed among my viewers may have noticed that all lenses in the range are marked SAM. It stands for smooth autofocus motor. Not sure why they chose to call it that, because it's not smooth at all. But the important part is that the SAM lenses have an autofocus motor built into them, while the original Minolta lenses for A-mount do not, and instead rely on the autofocus motor in the camera body. Out of all Minolta film SLRs, only a few later models have the capacity to detect a motor in the lens and work correctly with it. The Dynax 7, Dynax 5, 4, 3L, 40, and 60. Curiously enough, the Minolta flagship, Dynax 9, could be factory upgraded to work with motorized lenses, but did not have that capability out of the box. Now, you can still mount these lenses on any other A-mount camera, and nothing terrible will happen, and the mirroring will still work, but the autofocus will not. Next up, three lenses, the 30mm macro, 35mm, and 50mm, are also marked DT. That was a Sony designation for lenses that were designed to cover only an APS-C or crop sensor, which is considerably smaller than a standard 35mm film frame or a full-frame digital sensor, which is the same size. Logically, that should take those three lenses out of consideration for film shooters, doesn't it? I mean, we are shooting full frame, as it were. Well, as you will see when we look at individual lenses, things are not quite so cut and dry. In fact, the only lens that really struggles to cover a standard 35mm frame in any meaningful way, meaning at most aperture settings and focus distances, is the 35mm f1.8. It really produces not just heavy vignetting, but completely black cut-out corners. So that's why I'm not including that lens in my series. Which is a shame, really, because otherwise it's a very capable lens. Finally, why should you care about these lenses? After all, Minolta was producing A-mount lenses for over 20 years. So they are abundant on the used market, often at affordable prices, and many of them are excellent performers. Well, clearly that's exactly what A-mount shooters thought when Easy Choice range was introduced because these lenses never sold very well, and Sony did not actually put all that much effort into marketing them either. But there are also some good reasons to consider these budget offerings from Sony. Sure, there may be comparable Minolta alternatives, but easy choice lenses may either provide a superior optical performance, or a unique capability that their Minolta counterpart does not have, and then some of them simply do not have a direct competitor in the Minolta lineup. Another, slightly more curious reason to consider these lenses is that film shooters are actually in a unique position to make best use of them. Think about it for a second. You could use these lenses, as intended, on digital A-mount bodies, but that system is now discontinued, the models are out of production, and except for the latest flagship, the Sony A99 Mark II, which came out in 2016, mind you. They are really quite outdated at this point, and I wouldn't recommend using one, let alone buying one. Of course, with a proper adapter, you could adapt easy choice lenses to pretty much any mirrorless camera out there, as I do on my Lumix S1. But let me tell you, this use case really highlights the mediocre build quality, because now you are stuck with manual focus, and focus rings are easily the worst part of easy choice lenses. 
narrow, wobbly, non-textured with short travel and questionable dampening. These lenses were clearly designed for consumers that Sony thought would never bother with manual focus. And it shows. So, in a rather ironic twist, the best way to use these lenses, lenses that were designed in the digital age and for digital cameras, is on film. So, tune in next week for my review of the first lens in the series, the 50mm f1.8. That's it, folks. Hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, remember to like, comment, share, and subscribe, as that would really help this channel grow. Till next time.